Eared. <laughs> I I can so imagine years. I can imagine being on that side of it. There, it probably is a bit of a weird feeling. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is uh, my immense pleasure uh, to introduce tonight a, a man that I would assume needs no introduction at this point. But uh, I'll just I'll say this much for folks who don't already know. He chain smokes and he says fuck a I lot. Do. I uh, sure do. But, you know, we accept him as he is. And he accepts us too. I do. Yeah. Yeah. I ain't got no problem with nobody. But Jamie Deluxe. No normal people at least. No normal people at least. Yeah. Jamie Deluxe, officially, welcome to Liberty <laughs> Radio. Am I on my, my first, third smoke already? Because I might be. I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think you've been here. I don't count them. I don't count them. I don't, and it doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't right. matter. It's at least my second, but that's cool. You know, whatever. So is that is that typically an indication of something? I just I, I don't know. I just saw somebody say something in the chat. The only chat I'm looking no. at, by the way, because I know you're on multiple platforms, is Rumble. That's the only one I can see right now. That's the only one too, worth paying attention to. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm too lazy to open, to like try to figure out all the other ones. Uh, Did well, you do the recent video on the the finders? It was it wasn't recent. I made it, I I recently uploaded it again. But yeah, it's from 2019. Yeah, I I did that one. Yeah, it's like five years ago now. Though it's crazy. That is crazy. It, it's funny that you mentioned 2019. I was actually in Myrtle Beach in the summer <laughs> of 2019. So was I. <laughs> yeah, I know. Problem is, I didn't know that's where you were at the time. Otherwise, I might have tried to to come find you. There's, I'm uh, like, a, I'm a slut. Anybody's welcome. If anybody hits my hits up Myrtle Beach, you can ask. Well, I'm I, I don't really like I, I don't kiss and tell. So people come through. I hang out with them, smoke a joint, or whatever. If I can, if we're able to, or whatever, hang out. But it's probably been like over the last eight, almost eight years, like 50, 60 people oh, have wow. come through. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. So oh, yeah. who who um who was notable that that stands out in your mind? Like who are you like, oh wow, I can't believe this person reached out to me. I don't know. Uh I I don't really like, you know, it's not I'm not really like that anymore. I, I've been doing it so long. Cause you know, early on I covered Hollywood Hollywood so much, so I've talked to people there. And I don't really, you know, I'm not I don't really get starstruck or anything like that. But if you're talking about Myrtle Beach, uh, two people that have come through that I'm, you know, that I hung out with and uh, got to know and podcasted with, they actually they came to my fucking house are Media Bear. Oh, nice. Dr. Clown. Dr. Yeah. Clown. On my, on my birthday, 9-11, he came through. And I'm not going to say whether we smoked weed or not. We know I did. I'm, I'll leave everybody guessing whether he did or not. He did. And Dr. Treving, uh, the author of Goodbye Germ Theory, a book... Uh, from two th well he, he originally wrote it in like 99 but it didn't really come out to until like 2004 he's been over here three times so i didn't smoke weed with him though i don't think he doesn't smoke weed but that would have been cool yeah <laughs> well, i think it's cool that you got to hang out with media bear he's cool as fuck yeah yeah i, I got to meet his wife and stuff but i only really got to hang out with him because you know he's got a family and stuff they were here on vacation but we did a live stream from right here and yeah like i said I actually, I was really, it was awesome. my birthday. I was really fucking high. It was my birthday. He probably was too, but <laughs> yeah, no, he's a cool dude. I like him. That was a hell of a birthday yeah. present then. Yeah, I invited him over because I knew he was here for the weekend. We were trying to figure out a time, and I was like, you know, why don't you come over my birthday and we'll do a 9 11 stream? So he did. Yeah, when I was down there, uh, I was in, I say down there, I'm actually further south now uh, than where you are because I'm, I'm down in Texas, right around the Gulf area. Uh, but I was living okay. in Northern Virginia back mm. in 2019. So uh, that's probably where that I, came from. I broke down in Fredericksburg, Virginia, which is Northern Virginia. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, While well, on tour when I was young. I was younger, so I could deal with it then. Uh, was, uh, a that's a horrible place to break down. Well, we slept in a Pet Boys parking lot. We were waiting on a fucking, for, for, for them to fix our van. But yeah, we were just like, teenagers on tour in a punk band so i think i might yeah. know the pet boys that you're talking about was it right by the the interstate there it must have been by the interstate because I, I didn't drive then but we would feed our drummer trucker speed he was the only one with a license and we just made him drive everywhere the shitty ass van we had but uh yeah there was pet boys there was a gas station because i know i tried to take a shit 
But I had a. Well, no, because me and my brother, my brother was my bass player. We slept on the concrete outside. We slept through a blanket on the ground. And it, it was nice at night, just so like our singer and drummer and roadie could have somewhere to sleep in the van. Not like we were giving it up for our roadie, but we just didn't give a fuck. But I woke up and it's like the concrete was cooking my belly on the ground. And then oh, like, I, you know, I have trouble going in public anyway, but uh, there's like a gas station there and I'm was, I was trying to get, take a shit. And there's like a gap in the door like this big and like truckers, like all these rednecks, like trying to push the door. I'm assuming they were rednecks because they're truckers, but uh, yeah, it was pretty traumatizing. It's pretty yeah. traumatizing. Well, I can imagine. Go. That yeah, that sounds go yeah, that sounds like a majority of the public uh, restrooms in that area of Virginia. <laughs> Trust me, I visited <laughs> quite a few of them. I, well, I was trying to think. We didn't play there, though. We broke down there. We played. We did play Arlington, Virginia, though, right. which is northern. Well, Virginia. there was there was nothing to play in Fredericksburg. There's still okay. <laughs> yeah. I don't really know much about it. I just know it's broken down there. It's a, Wait, it's a stop off the interstate, basically. That's what it was for us yeah. for a night. But yeah, yeah. yeah. But no, yeah. when I was when I was in Myrtle Beach in uh, 2019, uh, me and my significant other at the time uh, got had an argument like within 24 hours of showing up. So it, it was one of those vacation trips, right? Oh, those are fun. Oh yeah. So I ended up spending the majority of the week at a little bar there called Pops Place. Oh, I know Pops Place. Do you yeah. know Pops? They do carry, yeah. yeah. I don't know Pops, but I know someone that used to work there at least. It's down by Family Kingdom. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I really yep. dug it, man. It it reminded me of a lot of the places like back where I grew up in Virginia, you know, because it was just kind of unassuming, tucked out of the way, uh, just type of local spot. You know, hole yeah. in the wall type of place. My my significant other used to hang out there before we met, but uh, I I've been there with her, but I never really hung out there. I never played there or anything, but I played all around the, the area. I know exactly where it is. Though. It's still open. I think it's still open. Pretty Good. sure, yeah. Good. Yeah, I, sure. I was hoping that they had survived COVID. I, I think know a lot had, of places didn't. Yeah, like, like a few things closed here, but not much. I mean, the schools closed. Like like J C Penny closed for a while. Uh, I work at a car dealership here. I had for over 10 years. We didn't close at all, you know, and most places didn't. So I, I don't know. It wasn't that bad here, except for everybody wore masks. I never did though. No one, the only place I got shit at one place. I got shit at a head shop. I was going to get Kratom at Purple Haze, his head shop, and they gave me shit. But besides that, I didn't get any shit for not wearing a mask. I was just like, I'm not going to do it. That's crazy. But that's the <laughs> only place you got pushback. Yeah. I mean, I went to a, one of those little gas stations in front of Walmart to get like uh, cigarettes or whatever. And the lady told me you have to wear a mask. And I told her, I'm not going to. I was like, somebody's going to push back. She's like, well, I got to wear a mask. I'm like, well, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to do it. And she didn't give me any trouble after that, you know? So that's it. That's it. Nice. So how, how has uh, Myrtle beach fared since things have started, as they say, opening up again, if that's actually a happening? Well, the only thing, yeah, the schools opened up and, you know, the mall opened up again. I don't know if the whole mall closed, but uh, I mean, I, I feel like we're doing decent. Um, but people still came here, just might have slowed down a little bit. So, I mean, and it's still kind of been like, I mean, I, more people are coming back, but it's it, it seems kind of slower just because I haven't been stuck in so much traffic every summer mm -hmm. going to work and shit. But I could be wrong. I, I try to avoid the boulevard. I mean, I hung out there when I was younger, but I try to avoid the, unless I'm playing a show in the area or something, I try to avoid down there. So I'm just saying, you know, I've, I've lived here 30, God damn, 33 years. <laughs> like oh, that wow. number is being brought up. Yeah. Mark that down, Shelly. <laughs> I'm originally from Massachusetts, like south of Boston, but I moved here when I was 11, 33 years ago. So, so what, what made you decide to move at the age of 11? I just decided I was time. It's time to be on my own. You know, no, I don't know. My family moved. It was, uh, it was either. I, I don't know exactly, but I think it had to do with like uh, bad checks and drug dealing. Just because I remember the cops raided our house and arrested my stepfather. Oh, holy shit! And yeah, up in Massachusetts. And I knew we had pot plants growing in the closet. I was only 11, though, so I don't, I don't really know the extent of it. And I think it was selling cocaine for a while because I had a dirt bike and I raced dirt bikes up there. I just don't really know the whole thing. I never really asked. You know, we just, uh, his parents lived here and my stepfather, so we moved down here. That's, That's about as much as I know. Yeah. 
I, well, I'm always I'm always interested to hear those types of stories, right? Because I I don't have one of those. Like I didn't have like the cops raided my house because of something that you know when I was little because of something that one of my parents did or like a brother or sister or anything like that. It was always like mm-hmm. an associate of my father whose house was yeah. getting raided, and I was hearing about it at the dinner table. I heard about that too, but I know they did rate, they arrested him. And I really don't know the specifics about it because I was just young, you know? Right. I just said that we moved here. We got in a bad wrecking ball tomorrow on the way down. I thought I was going to die the whole night because we had, we, uh, one of our cars got, we had a moving truck in a car. The car got tro- totaled. And then we moved here to the, the shitty ass fucking trailer park in the ghetto. And, you know, everything changed for me because I'm from living in Massachusetts to moving down to South Carolina. <laughs> I had a mullet, but it was 91, so it was kind of acceptable then. It was a heavy metal mullet, though, you know, so it was kind of, I thought it was cool. And then my I cousin think and me. are still acceptable in certain parts. They are the now, country. yeah. I, I don't think they were for a while, but they're back, yeah. Uh, then me and my cousin found, like, a five-iron golf club in a ditch, and we're hitting, like, golf. Well, we had golf balls. I don't know where the fuck we found them. We're hitting golf balls and, and rocks down the dirt road, and I'm standing behind them, and... I was like a short fat kid at the at the time. I mean, I'm I'm not short now. I mean, I'm not tall, but I'm not short. I'm like five eleven. So I guess it's like a little, a little above average. A little yeah. above average, we'll say a little bit, you know. All right. But <laughs> but I was like a short, shorter fat kid, and he was like tall and athletic. And I was standing behind him, and he and he swung and missed the ball, but he was like he hit it full force. He you know swung full force and hit me right in the eye, right in oh. the eyebrow. So I had blood everywhere and I, you know, I didn't know what was going on. And so I had to get my eyebrows stitched back together. So I'm new from Massachusetts. So I sound weird to everybody, you know, cause at the time I probably did have a pretty bad, like, you know, Boston accent. Not that we lived in Boston, but we didn't live far from Boston. We lived like 30 minutes South of Boston and, uh, and a mullet. And then I was like Frankenstein. They had some eyebrow back together and shit. And then my, my father tells me the truth. That I didn't know that it wasn't my real father because he's leaving my mom. So I didn't know my dad. I thought it was my dad. Yeah, everything changed. It, it, was, it was pretty fucked up. Everything was uh, weird and changed. So, but you know, it was traumatic, but I got through it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't have a problem with him, though. My, his, his actual son and daughter do, my brother and sister, they have a problem with him. But I, don't, I, I look at it differently now. I appreciate everything he did for me. Being that I wasn't a son, I didn't have any idea that he was my dad until then, you know. So is that is that a shift that you had to make in your own thinking at some point? Yeah, I had like a spiritual awakening and I didn't start seeing it because you know, I was an atheist my whole life until I had until I had kids. And then everything short, short, shortly changed after, you know, and I started looking at things. I don't mean like. I like, I don't even like talking about like that kind of stuff because I think mm-hmm. it's more of a personal thing. Gotcha. But it's not religious. Religious, really. I mean, I don't mind it, but I, like you know, it, it's, it still feels kind of weird to me though. But uh, basically, I started looking at things from other perspectives. I guess you know what I mean. So uh, that happened in like 2014 or something like that. Well, yeah, my son was born in 2013. So my biological father, yeah, I uh, I found him online right before I like right around when I was about to turn 30. I knew his name and everything. And uh, for some reason, I felt like I wanted to try to find him. So I did. And then I found out, like, you know, his his brothers and sisters and all this other shit. And I called him, but he hung up on me. But I later found out that uh, he had heart surgery at the time. So he was in the hospital. And in 2016, my significant other, who is also from Massachusetts, ironically, but it's not that weird because my sister is mar- her, my sister's husband's from Massachusetts. Like, we've all met down here, though. Because most people in Myrtle Beach aren't from this area. We're all like a lot of us move moved down south, you know, at some point in our life. Well, it is called the Redneck Riviera. It is, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. or yeah, and, and I'm a uh, damn Yankee. You, you move, you move down here, That's you right. never leave. Yeah, yep, yep. So uh, I'm sure. Well, I'm sure there are a lot of similarities with the, uh, you know, the um, the beaches and and whatnot up in Massachusetts. I haven't actually been able to visit those beaches, but I, I well, I have. Yeah, they're, they're, they're kind of similar. They're, they're, Kind of similar. I mean, I've probably been, a lot uh, more rocks up north. There, I was gonna say that yeah. there are a lot more rocks up there. There are a lot more rocks up there. Yeah, I was just up there in like 2019, I think, the last time, and we went to uh, 
where is it? Uh, Plymouth Rock. We brought the kids, you know, we were on the Plymouth plantation where I used to go as a kid on field trips and shit. But uh, yeah, so in 2016, my significant other, what, because she wanted to visit family and stuff. She taught me into it. I didn't want to do it though, but you know, she taught me into going up north. I, we had two kids at that point, which was, we, we still do. We don't have any more, but they were just younger, you know? And so I, I finally met my father in 2016. Which was weird, but it was cool, you know. He died in 2019, so I'm glad I, I, I went. I'm glad I got to meet him and stuff, you know. I didn't really care for some because you know you don't really miss what you never had, but right. I'm still glad, you know. I found my sisters up there that I didn't know I had and all that. But uh, yeah, I, I, I smoked a bunch of weed with him. You know, I don't have any. I don't have any problem with him either. You know, he left before I was born, so I don't have a problem with him. He was just a kid, like 18, 19. Oh wow. <laughs> yeah, my mom had me when she was 19, so she raised me. And then, you know, the stepfather came in the picture when I was like two, probably. I don't, I don't really know, though. But yeah, I don't have a problem with any of them. So nope. at, at what point in your life did you discover a passion for music? When I was really young. Really? I used to listen to, yeah, and uh, this is the 80s. I loved like Guns N' Roses and Metallica. And uh, really young, I had, you know, I had heavy metal mullet. And well, my uncle, my mom's oldest brother, she was the youngest of five kids, and she's the only girl. She had four older brothers. My uncle Mike would play guitar, and I always heard the story that my uncle Mike was the original guitar player, Aerosmith. I didn't really know whether to believe it, believe it or not, but I had always heard that. And uh, I would go over his house before we moved down here, and he had like all these guitars, and we played guitar and stuff. And so I knew I wanted to play guitar for a band, and I loved like all the music and shit. He used to listen to WAAF, which is the Boston radio station. And uh, so I started playing guitar shortly after I moved here when I was 11. <coughs> Weird thing, though. 2016, I go to Massachusetts. I meet my father. I go see my Uncle Mike, who I hadn't seen since I was 11. You know, he lets me play his fucking, like, 1969 Les Paul. Oh. And we're trading stories because I've been in bands since I was 14, you know, and I've toured most of the country not everywhere but everywhere from like new york city to florida to las vegas but we never made it to california we got in an accident but you know we were booked there <clears throat> all that shit. then he died the next year so well no i'm, I'm jumping forward I'm jumping forward so i come back home and then the band i was in at the time sons of adam atom we were like i don't know kind of like rock but we had like a kind of 80s throwback like uh like the cars kind of okay. I mean, it was just weird but it was good it was good though good band so kind of like a so, progish sound i don't know Almost. how to explain it i don't know see me and my singer who i'm still in bands with today have been playing together since we were 15 just kind of different variations of music and we still play together today he's my best friend at that time some of the songs like you know I, I've, I've heard the cars people have said but like you know a later version just basically because I play a little keyboard too. So that's all, that's kind of why, kind of poppy rock, I guess. It was good though. So we play a show and and I uh, I lived in a decent neighborhood and I left all my equipment in my car like a fucking dumbass and I got robbed that night. So they, they stole my Les Paul, they stole my oh. other guitar, my Schecter Tempest. I, I'm, also, I'm a multi-instrumentalist, so they stole my Korg synthesizer, my amp. My bass I had in the car for a backup bass for our bass player. It was an Ibanez active pickup because I also play bass and everything, you know. And then, uh, <clears throat> like uh, a few weeks later, I come home from work on my lunch break. I don't have any equipment anymore. And my uncle, who I had just seen in September, the month before, sent me his backup guitar, which is an SG. And he's like, you can't be a guitar player without a guitar. And so he sent me his backup guitar. And uh, he's like, uh, it was in a Gibson box, and there was a note saying, "Not, not a Gibson. Sorry, next time." It was an Epiphone, but it's an Epiphone SG Pro. It, it's it's like top of the line Epiphone. Oh yeah, they're they're still decent. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah, yeah. I mean, I've had some shitty Epiphones. This is this isn't a two hundred dollar Epiphone. This is like nine hundred dollar Epiphone. You know, it's yeah. a lot better. <clears throat> so that was awesome of them. And then, he, so I flew up back up the mass with my mom. Went to his funeral, and I have on video my grandmother who died the year after that actually but my grandmother i have her on video telling the story about when uh her you know her husband left her you know this is her oldest son's funeral she already buried one son in 1994 i think uncle mark hmm. so uh you know she had five kids she's telling the story 
And she's like, uh, so Mike quit school and he, he wanted to take a loan from me. A, this band he's been jamming jamming with in Hopedale, and they were going, they wanted to move to Boston. And she's like, uh, I could, she's like, I couldn't afford it. I was a single mom of five kids. And uh, the band moved on, and that was Aerosmith. And she's like, and I still, she, my, I have video of it. My grandmother saying, I worked with Joe Perry. I, I always heard this too. Uh, Joe Perry's mom worked for me at the Glen Allen Country Club, Country Club, where I was a manager. And she's like, um, his mom, his mom Mary. And she's like, I've always been friends, friends with Mary, and Mike's always been friends with Joe. And she's like, one day my grandmother, Virginia, Jenny, she's like. One day, Mary tells me, Jenny, be glad Mike didn't go off with the band. Joe's anorexic and on drugs. But but then she made, like, you can hear me crying and laughing as I'm filming, because I filmed it. Hmm. And she's like, but uh, I, <laughs> I forget what kind of car she said, but she, uh, yeah, she's like, but I did get a Mercedes Benz and a chalet, uh, whatever, chalet and, and uh, what's the word for a hotel? Chalet? Uh... I don't know what it's called, but uh, in Vermont so yeah chalet i think it's a chalet yeah because a chalet is the thing that you beat people with grammy grammy told my i, I called the grammy she told the story a lot better than me because i'm telling it second hand and i don't really remember and i was emotional but uh so she did that she she uh told that at his, at his funeral but i i recently read joe perry's book and it line everything lines up man it does line up i always heard that but it's one of those things where you just you know, you tell kids in school and they don't believe it or whatever. So then I'm like, well, they might have been exaggerating, and there right. could be some exaggeration there or whatever. I don't, I don't think. You know, I think because when I read Joe Perry's book, he was just jamming with everybody and trying to get everybody to move to uh, Boston from Hopedale. Now uh, they didn't live in Hopedale; they lived in the town over. At the time, I think it was Mills from Edway. I'm not really sure. I'd have to listen to the video again or read the book again. But yeah, it lines up though. So that's all I can say. So, so what is your opinion of, cause it sounds like you've, you've done a fair amount of research just as a byproduct of, of who you are, uh, mm-hmm. around Aerosmith. What is your opinion of, you know, their fame, their rise to popularity? Well, and, and all you of hear that? a lot of, you do hear a lot about, uh, Steven Tyler. Oh, yeah. Now reading, reading Joe Perry's book. And just general, just hearing stuff, you know, information comes out. I haven't heard anything about him bad. The only thing in the book is, I did notice in like 2008 or nine, he was hanging out with, uh, trying to do the science and rock thing with Francis Collins. And I almost thought about making a video about it. I just don't really know where to go about it. Cause I, even though I don't agree with any of that, I was pretty dumb at one point too, when it came to like science. So I, I don't know. This is like 2009, but, uh, have you heard any of Francis Collins's music? <laughs> yeah, I don't remember, but yeah, I heard him do some stupid shit like during yeah. COVID or whatever. But yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. that's that's not, specifically not, what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. That I don't know. Should not be allowed near musical instruments ever. Oh, I agree, I agree. But yeah, it was like in joke. I, I like I read like when I say read books, I do read books. I used to at least. It's hard to sit down and read anymore. But uh, I have lots of books, but I'm talking about Audible. I, I do read a lot on Audible because I, I, my job affords me the time to listen to books all day, mm. you know. So I have to read it again, uh, listen to it again. But, uh, yeah, he's talking about they're trying to do something with, like, science and rock. And this is, like, 2008 or nine or some shit like that. And there's supposedly, like, posters made of him that says something about science. And it's got, like, Joe Perry and uh, Francis Collins in it and, I don't know. It's just weird. Well, it sounds it sounds like something that the ad council would try to put together. Something like that. Right? Yeah. 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 I can see that. That's totally well, believable. Well, see, when when Joe Perry moved to Boston from Hopedale, Mass, it Stephen Tyler was even in the band yet. You know, uh, Joe Perry was jamming with a bunch of different people, and that's where I that's where it makes sense. Well, he's probably one of them was probably my uncle. He didn't really, you know, he's just trying to see what he meshes with. Now I've read a lot of these uh, rock stars uh, biographies, and that's kind of like the way it was. And I guess mm-hmm. being a musician myself, musician myself, we, we jam, I've jammed with lots of people too, when I, especially when I was younger. You know, you see who sticks. But it was him and um, the bass player, whatever his name, I, I can't remember his name, Hamilton, something Hamilton. They're the ones that first moved there. Then they secured the drummer and Steven, and then the other guitar player. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. 
Interesting. So, Steven it, Tyler PJs. That goes through my head like every day. Steven Tyler, you ever seen uh, Son-in-Law? No, Probably that's sure. one I haven't seen. Oh my god, I've seen yeah. it. Like, I've seen it like five hundred times. Really? So, I've seen I've seen Grandma's Boy like five hundred times. So that was that, that's too new. That's too new for me. Oh really? <laughs> wow. Well, I mean, I've seen it. I have seen it, but I'm saying like Son-in-Law. Something that, since I was like a young teenager. I, when did that come out? Like early nineties. Something like that. I, I don't know how old you. How old are you? I turned fifty this year. You're older than me. What the fuck? Yeah. How do you not know? How do you know? You got to watch it then. I, I was never a it. fan of Polly Shore. That's why. I, I can see. I can see that. I can see not being a fan of Polly Shore. It's the same uh, reason why I haven't seen like most of Tom Cruise's movies. I just have no I interest you, I in you. watching him for. Two I guess hours. At, at my age in the eighties, I was a lot because I'm forty four. So in the eighties, I was young. I was born in eighty. Oh shit! You're 11. a young buck yet. I feel old as fuck. I feel like somebody beat the shit out of me. I got like a like a pinch fucking something muscle back here or something that's hurt me. I know. I, that started around <laughs> 42 or possibly earlier. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so uh, I don't know. I guess at my age, you know, because Paulie Shore came out in the 80s. So I, I got, you know, I was young. So, <laughs> and you know what, though? He follows me on Twitter. So Paulie Shore does. Not the, nice. you know, Jenna, Jamie, not, Jamie, <laughs> Jenna Jameson does too, though. So. That's a rare company. You might you might just have to hold on to that for later. <laughs> well, she's been following me for years though, but I followed her though. She disappeared for a while. In the army, yeah. But I don't know. Son in law and what else were probably my favorites back then. I don't it might have been just you know why it might have been? It might have just been because I had it on VHS. So having something on VHS for being oh, yeah. porn, I have a, I probably that's probably why I watched it so much. There's a few movies like that, you know. Well, yeah, especially back then, before yeah. you had like on-demand services like oh, Netflix yeah, yeah. and everything. It's it's whatever you had around. That's what you were watching. Weezing the juice. Yep. Yeah. Don't wheeze the juice. No, oh, you I know was, what else too? I'll oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say, like when when I was living <coughs> in uh, St. Louis, the summer of '96. I, we watched mall rats almost every single day. All right. All right. All right. You know? <laughs> Cause it was there. We had it. I was just talking about this. Is the way I worked the other day. <coughs> Cause I work at a car dealership. Now I don't, I'm not a salesman or anything. I'm the photographer and graphic designer. Oh, nice. But yeah, yeah. I've been doing it for over 10 years. I that's th- a I way better gig than salesman too. Oh, hell yeah. I mean, I, I get, that's why I get to listen to books all day. Cause I'm pretty much left alone unless they need me to do something or whatever. But usually I just, See what cars I need to shoot. Go get you know, get the keys. Drive them around the corner, like a mile or two oh, away. That's sweet. Uh, I mean, I can drive them all around town because for a while I was doing a campaign when I was driving around this for a while. I, I mean, like three years in a row. I, the reason I'm not doing it now is kind of, I've kind of lost it for, uh, inspiration. Driving in front of local businesses and shooting the car in front of the business, and then tagging them on social media from our social media, kind of like a cross networking thing. Mm-hmm. But, but how many fucking times can I shoot a car at Broadway at the beach? You know, I, I kind of just lost interest in it. But uh, yeah, I have a license plate I carry with me everywhere. I can just take off and go anywhere if I want. So it's it's pretty uh, decent. But um, I forget where I, I forget where we're going with this. There was a point. There was a point. I think I lost a point though. Yeah, I don't know. I said mall rats, and you started going somewhere. Mall rats. All right, yeah. thank you, thank you. That that got me back on track. So the other day, they're having a meeting, and then. It, like, because I work for the office where they do like the phone sales and stuff. Now that's just where my computer is, and that's the guy that hired me as that boss or whatever. So that's like the office I'm in. So they all got to do phone sales, and I just kind of go off and do my own thing all day. Uh, but sometimes when I get there in the morning and they have a meeting or whatever, I'll sit. Th- I'll sit there for it or whatever. So my boss was like uh, talking about swingers. Remember that movie? Oh yeah. And in the scene, he's like leaving messages. He's like the scene where uh, not John, uh, is it John Favreau, Favreau or whatever? Yes. All right. So he's leaving the, the message for the girl, and he keeps calling her back. He's like, you know, because uh, he, he didn't get his number down right. And he's like, I just got out of a six year relationship, or whatever. And my boss, because my computer has speakers, my boss tells me to play that for everybody. So <laughs> I'm like cracking up. And then I remember I'm like in '97, I think. I lived in an apartment with my friends, we, like pretty much my van, but you know, and another friend. And we had like two VHSs. So we had swingers and we had mall rats. So we watched swingers and mall rats every fucking night. And you mentioned mall rats. It's fucking crazy. That's one that for me too, though. Yeah. You know, that definitely is. I mean, it's just, it's a damn good thing that movie was a classic. 
It is. Yeah, it was a good I one. don't think I would still love it after 500 viewings if it wasn't. Yeah, I, I was an early Kevin Smith fan. So all I still think ones, it's yeah. it's one of the best movies that he's ever done. Yeah, yeah it's good. That's my opinion. I haven't, I haven't seen it in a while. I admit, I haven't seen it in a while, but I can picture it all, and it's definitely a good one. It's up there, you know. Yeah. So you're Ooh. currently in two bands, right? Yes. So two bands. You have a full time job. You have a family yes. that you take care yes. of. Yes. And you and produce I, media. I try. Yeah. It's gotten harder as my kids get older. My son just turned eleven on Saturday, and man, this that's been it's been so stressful trying to get everything together for that. And like, I don't want, you know, especially with COVID and shit, the world pissed me off so much that I, I try to spoil my kids the best I can without spoiling them, you know? Right. So they expect a lot, but I just want, I don't know. I want them to have a better life than I did. And, and then, and then like all this shit happens. So it, it's pretty, uh, it's fucked me up. I'll say that. Hmm. But it seems like you're, you're dealing with it better than most. I try. I've been drinking a lot lately. Not like a lot, lot, but you know, yeah. a few, a few, uh, a few of these mini bottles a night to deal with it. They only have like a double mini bottle, but I've already drank them like two since I've been on your thing. You know, it's oh. uh, but you know, that's I can handle that. I was a drug addict for many years, so alcohol is nothing. It's not like I drink at work or anything like that. But the weed's just not enough lately. You know, I've just been depressed hmm. about everything. Any what? updates on Micah Miller? No, uh. I mean, I heard a lot of the of you know a lot of the speculations with her husband have been uh, uh, debunked, I guess. But it is weird. I knew her. I knew that girl. I worked. I worked in a screen printing shop with her for like eight months. You know, this is twenty twelve. It's when yeah, it's before what I had kids. What is this? Michael, Michael Miller was familiar. She was she was married to a pastor around here at a church, this big church around here. I'm, I don't go to church or anything like that. You know, like I said, I'm not religious. I did have that spiritual awakening after my son. Was I mean, born, I had but... you pegged for a Baptist, but, <laughs> uh, but like, so I, yeah, I didn't know really much about that, but it's a big, it's pretty big around here. And she was married to the pastor. And then she apparently killed herself. This is earlier this year. She drove to North Carolina and killed herself. And, you know, I could see maybe her husband drove her to kill herself, but they, they have video of her at the pawn shop buying, a, buying the gun. A lot of people were saying her husband killed her. I kind of thought that was a good possibility, too. They have video of her buying the gun and blah, blah, blah. There's still a lot of weird shit to it. Uh, and she was only like, I don't know, 31, 32. Her husband was oh, wow. maybe a little, a little older than me. But... In 2012, I worked. I worked at a screen printing shop, and I worked with this girl. She was like 19 then. I was like probably 31 or something like that. And you know, she's really pretty too, like really cute and all that. I thought it was kind of weird. She, she was really religious back then, and that's before I had my spiritual awakening and stuff. But I, I mean, I was always cool with her and everything like that. You know, I just thought she was kind of weird. I think that's a perception of her too, because the owners like. <laughs> See, here's the thing. I think she was starting with that with her soon her later on husband back then mm -hmm. because the way the owners of that shop were at and they never tell me that my guy went through a lot and she was only 19 or whatever that she went through a lot and it's going through a lot or whatever i just didn't really know because i was going through my own shit you know i had knocked somebody up and i didn't have kids and i was scared of that i was playing for a reggae band like five nights a week making money not enough though because i needed a job but you know it wasn't enough to pay the bills or anything like that but uh yeah, I worked with her for a while. I mean, she was always cool with me and everything. But yeah, she killed herself this year, earlier this year. Do you think she got the shots? I don't know, because I, I never, especially if somebody's religious, I don't know. I really don't know. I will be. I will say that I'm surprised at a lot of people that got the shots around, my, you know, friends of mine, uh, people I work with and stuff. You know, I, I'm very surprised by it. Like, I don't expect to hear it, but I hear it, you know? Yeah, because I I didn't get any. I made sure she didn't get any. You know, the the mother of my kids and my kids didn't get any, but that's all I can say for sure. Well, a lot of my best were, friends got them. Yeah, there were a fair amount of you know people who you know you would otherwise identify as Christian that were just like out there lining up for it. They were like, stick I, it in my arm. It can't get mm -hmm. in there fast enough. And I would see personally, I would think if you were that, if you were like very like religious, say you would say no, but 
yeah, it's pretty crazy. It's crazy how they pull it off. And I, I can just hope for the best, you know, because I personally, it went viral, but personally, I'm the one that found that clip of Fauci saying, I don't remember what year it was. I want to say 99, but it could have been 2009. I, don't, I make so many videos that I, it's hard for me to remember right. precisely without looking at it again. I want to say 99. I'm the one that found this clip of Fauci saying it could take 12 years for all hell to break loose. I'm the one that found that. It went. Hmm. I don't get a lot of credit for a lot of shit I, I, I find or whatever, but whatever. I'd rather than the info be out. Maybe I can get credit later, whatever. Right. But uh, yeah, it went viral, which I'm glad of. But yeah, I'm saying, you know, vaccine effects up to 12 years later uh it's i I just hope for the best because you know my best friend got him Hmm. and he even apologized me later even though i didn't really know we were having a a riff about it online or anything because we were still actively in a band together and we still are we've been best friends for 30 something years uh but he's got at least two maybe a booster and the booster was because his mom wanted him to get it and that's when he he already knew it was bullshit but i don't know yeah wow I mean, I, I understand all of that because I, I come from a family of uh, manipulators. Yeah. So there was, there was a lot of uh, emotional blackmail that went on in the interpersonal relationships just in, in our little four-person unit. Yeah. Um, so I, I understand how that can work on a person. A lot of families, yeah. A lot of families yeah. are like that. I mean, we all every family has their own problems. I have, My family has problems. I, like honestly, like I was about to fucking explode before I went on here. Not explode, but I had a headache. My sometimes my I love my I love my family more than anything. Yeah. Sometimes my kids drive me fucking crazy. Yeah, my my significant other drives me crazy. Yeah, but we all have our own problems, you know. Yeah, I love them to death though. Well, the reason the reason that I asked about uh, Micah Miller and whether or not she might have gotten them is because of all the the recent evidence that has come to the surface, even though I suspected this was going to be the case from the beginning, but the evidence pointing towards uh, changes in personality. Yes. Following the shots. uh, You know what? In case of suicidal ideation, following the shots, especially following the news that they're doing so much damage, you know, people now have that buyer's remorse that they have to process or not, you know, just drag it through life with them. That's that's a possibility too. You know when I first like really noticed that, my uh, my significant other is younger than me, so she's in her thirties. But she has a brother that's in his fifties. Her parents are like in their eighties. My mom, I'm forty four. My mom's only sixty three. Right. She had me young, you know. She's thirty seven. Her parents are like eighty two. Oh wow! But her brother, yeah, she was. They were in their forties. That she was, you know, an accident in their forties. That was an accident in my mom's teens. You know what I mean? So she has a brother that's almost as old as my mom, and I know he got him. And I remember, like, I don't know if it was Thanksgiving or Christmas at at the in laws' house. He was saying if he was in charge of schools, he and it pissed me off that he would make everybody, all the kids get him, and, and it fucking pissed me off. But you know, I was I wasn't trying to start trouble. Well, anyway. I try to play cool and all that, but like I used to drive this piece of shit 2004 Escape that would break down all the time, and he knows how to fix cars. And uh, so we drove my car to his house in Garden City, and I live towards Soxy, so more pretty much the outskirts of Myrtle Beach, but just south. And then I don't know okay. if you know where Garden City is; it's like a another 15 minutes south. Okay, you know, it's still you can still consider it Myrtle Beach, but you know they all have their own little beaches: There's Myrtle Beach, Surfside Beach, and then Garden City. Right. So we went and took, we dropped my car off at his house, sat down there, and we hopped in Susie's car, my, my significant other, and the kids, and we started heading home. Oh, he was following us back here for some some reason or whatever. And then he calls her and forgets he left something at his house that he needed to fix my car with. He's in my car, by the way. And uh, he needed to turn around, so turn around and follow him. I'm like, Does, he's been in our house a million times. Does he not fucking, he couldn't even fathom the thought of like driving by himself or whatever. And I'm just, it just like, it was like something hit. I was like, the, is it the shots like making them fucking stupid or something like that? Mm. There was no purpose. There was no, cause like, you know, the kids were, you know, even younger than they are now and they're young now. Uh, they were getting cranky. They wanted to go home and do whatever, you know. I don't know. That's the first time I noticed it. But yeah, it, it's turning people retarded, I think. Mm. So 
Well, retarded, and for the people who are smart enough to figure out exactly how it was that they were gamed, there's there's like a heavy guilt that they now have to carry with them, especially if they're a parent of a child and they oh, force man. that shit on their child. Think, think yeah, about having imagine. to walk through the rest of your life with that, knowing that you did the damage. You were the one that pulled the trigger. I just there. hope for the fucking best. Yeah, I mean... Yeah. It, it's hard enough as it is as a parent. I can imagine that guilt. Well, I think that was that was all part of the the planning for it. Like they knew that that these particular psychological effects were going to happen on the population if they went through with it. And look Lots at how hard they did. pushed. Yeah, here's right. I think that's all right because I don't know if you know. When you asked me earlier about people that I was like surprised that it reached out to me, mm -hmm. uh, and I mentioned well, Media Bear number one and Dr. Trebbing. Dr. Trebbing wrote a book called Goodbye Germ Theory. I'm at the point now where I, now that I like, I realize it's a belief. I don't believe in viruses anymore because it's never been scientifically proven. What they did was they changed the definition, they inverted it. The word virus actually means poison. And I'm not going to argue with anybody. People can believe what they want, but it is a belief. When it comes down to it, and I know most people don't know that. I didn't know that. It's a belief, pretty much. It's never been scientifically proven. So there's that. So another person I can't, and, and the reason, all right. First off, I found, I, I fell into the whole HIV thing, which I never knew anything about before. Now that, that's been proven, and pretty much they poisoned everybody with ACT at first, and then other drugs later that weren't as strong or, you know, as, as, as toxic, but still to toxic. So another person that I hooked up with was Celia Farber, who was a spin magazine reporter in the 80s and 90s. And she had a book called, um, what's it called? A serious, adverse effect, a serious Adverse Events, An Uncensored History of AIDS, because she was around the whole time writing about it and was, you know, wrote, did articles or interviews with Kerry Mullis, the PCR inventor, and Peter Duesberg, who was like the biggest AIDS that, uh, the biggest, I guess, AIDS denialist or whatever from in the 80s and 90s and so on. He's still alive. Uh, she hired, like, I became friends with her online. We did a podcast on my channel. And I helped her do some videos for some some um, things that she did. Like, uh, not speeches, but like, I don't know. She was asked to, to talk at some events, some in person, some online. So, you know, she, she hired me paid me i never had a set rate but she she was very generous every time to make uh, some videos for her talking points and then she hired me to help her annotate her book that was originally released in 2006 but came out again it was re-released in either 2022 or 2023 I'm, I'm not, i don't remember so i helped her annotate it it's completely annotated and she paid me for it why, why was i bringing that up i don't know i'm high and drunk but uh she was generous with my names on it or anything, but I'm I'm pretty proud of that. That's just another thing that brought me to it. Oh, here, here it is. So what they said was, oh, another, I made another video too called uh, Reverse Transcriptase Activities because that's how they claimed that they isolated HIV. Right. Because they found reverse transcriptase activities, which is where something attaches to a cell and transcribes into the cell. Right, right, right. Right. All right. They found, they See, found what they called product evidence. Not not it's, evidence uh, of the existence, but yeah, what, that what, what it created it's called? It's something. Called, um, yeah. It's called something else too, though. Uh, not evidence, but well, it's an inference, yeah. right? Yeah, it's it's, it's, it's uh, the same it's, shit that they do with quantum physics, like sur surrogate marker, I guess. Yeah, I don't know if that's the right term, but it's something to do with that. It's not it's not direct. It's not it's not a direct uh, evidence, but yeah, right. it's it's something that points to it. And that's what they used to have a press conference and claim. That's one of the things they used. So they would say that HIV would reverse transcribe into cells and then kill the cells. But cells, you know, kill themselves, you know, especially from right. all the toxins in the environment, breathing in, drinking our food. Why do you think they put chemicals and so much shit? So I I think with the, with the, especially, especially with MR, mRNA, that they they're trying to create something that reverse transcribes into the cell that can make the cells die and in that aspect kind of make their own hiv what they say hiv is 
because uh, they never found it, but they never proved it. But they can make it. I mean, I think they've been trying to make that the whole time. So that's what I was trying to say. Yeah, something that reverse transcribes in the cells and kills the cells. Right. Well, I don't, it, I don't consider myself an expert on uh, the subject. Oh, of, I'm not an, of what it, I'm just saying. I I see a lot of similarities between uh, HIV or what is commonly referred to as AIDS and yeah. COVID. Because it seems like they did the exact same thing with both of them, where they took well, yeah, a group no, of symptoms that they could attribute to a number of different causes, and they grouped them all like together. That, though, it it's was like, this like is that. what it is. Well, that's what AIDS is. AIDS isn't a disease. It's a group of... They, they put diseases in a basket and then call it AIDS if they can get a fucking fraud test and say you're positive, right. and then they kill you. Right. I mean, that's what it really is. This, what, this, what, that, is what is the process that's used for determining a positive or negative uh, HIV test? I don't know if it's, if it's still like this, but it was either a PCR test or before that, before that an antibody test, an uh, unspecific antibody test, because they're testing to see if they, you have certain proteins in you. And depending on what country you were in, they all have different standards for the test. So say you were in uh, one country that... I don't remember what specific country used what. I think Africa used uh, two bands of two 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 different proteins. So if you, they see these proteins in you, then that's an antibody test, and they say you have eight. Uh, but here's the thing: Africa, most places in Africa won't even use the test. They presume you're positive. Number one, and number two, they change the definition. You see, they do that a lot, right? They change definitions. Oh yeah, they, they call it the Bangui definition in Africa. So. The Bongui definition, they could say you have AIDS if you have uh, a certain amount of symptoms, whether it's diarrhea, like persistent diarrhea, um, with some weight loss, but uh, basically the same symptoms as malnutrition, the same symptoms as fucking malaria, tuberculosis, tuberculosis. Right. I can say it right. Yeah. Probably I maybe even a little test. polio, too. Well, and here's the thing with polio. I've, had that. I have, I've made videos about this, too. I found videos from the 50s, I'm guessing, around then, maybe 40s or 60s. They're fucking spraying the shit on the on kids' as fucking sandwiches, proving it safe and all that. So polio was DDT, and that's what it comes down to. And and they leave. I even found evidence of them trying to do this for African tribes, which didn't believe them that they were poisoning them with DDT. And I found evidence to Papua New Guinea. I didn't say it right. Papua New Guinea and Australia. So, because the guy that claimed Kuru, discover Kuru, was in Papua New Guinea, and he he's admitted and convicted pedophile. And without him, Carlton Gaidashik, they could never. He made up the theory because he couldn't he couldn't prove Kuru. He made up a theory called the slow virus theory, and without him. They could have never, ever had said that HIV, because up until then, the virus is, you know, a, few, a couple of days to a couple of weeks, they would say you would get sick. Because he, this fucking, I'm talking about psychopathic pedophile, admitted, I, I've made so many videos about this motherfucker. We'll go there, he's talking about loving the smell of fucking pig fat and sperm on these adolescent fucking tribal boys. He went there. <laughs> And fucking uh, that's that's a very specific it. odor. Yeah, yeah, it is. He went there and couldn't prove it, so he made up a theory. He made it up, saying it was a slow virus. So it took years to develop. Well, guess what? Without him, they could have never made up HIV. And said it helped. It took years to develop for AIDS. And guess what? Robert Gallo. The, the doctor that, quote, discovered HIV, that had a press conference before any of his papers were reviewed, which later on turned out to be fraud, government scientist, him and his wife put $65,000 up for a guy doctor to get out of jail after he was convicted of uh, molesting his, one, one of its, I think, 49 foster kids from islands. Damn, all these that's boys. a lot of kids. Well, he admitted on camera. To well, he didn't say molest. He said all the two hundred to four hundred twelve year eight to twelve year old boys had sex with me. It was all them coming to my bed. He admits that on camera. He's dead now, but thank God. Yeah, I wish he would have died a long time ago. This guy is the one that made up a theory 
that viruses could take years. Because when something isn't real anyway, they can just stretch it and change it whenever they want. And humans, we're just so stupid. We go along with it. Or we don't know, you know? Well, I think especially in America, you can see a systematic dumbing down of the population over the course of the 20th century. I mean, if you yeah. if you really like put your nose to the grindstone and you dedicate yourself to studying 20th century American history for like even just like 18 months, I think that's really about as long as it takes. You can oh, start God. seeing the thread that runs through the history. It's obvious. Yeah, especially since Rockefeller Medicine took over. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but here's another thing. And I found this, and it's not really talked, it's not talked about at all. I know a lot of people know who Dr. Day is. If you've ever heard of uh, what's it called? The New Order of Barbarians. And it's from Dr. It's from a doctor, an insider from 1969 that had a meeting with doctors in, in Pittsburgh, pediatric doctors, but he did it all over. He would travel around and do these meetings. Talking about how medicine would change, how human society would change over the next, you know, over the course of this is 69, so over the course of the next 30, 40 years. Right. And uh not to not to not to write this down, not to record it, whatever. And one doctor that was there, and his name escapes me at the moment, but I've I've made a few videos about it. Um, one doctor that was there in 1988 went public with the information because he remembered it. And he saw so much come true over that 20 year period that he just had to like put it down. You know, Lawrence Dunnigan, Dr. Dunnigan is the one who put it down 1988. I think, I think originally, and he's talking about Dr. Day and, uh, the future of medicine, how doctors, how doctors would, uh, not work, not be like uh, lone practitioners anymore. They would work for a company right. like a hospital or, whatever and, and and when you did that your your uh, boss wasn't your patient anymore because you weren't a contractor anymore you're, so you know what's the patient now it's who you're working for that's your boss right your HMO. You, you have no yeah you have no allegiance to the patient anymore you have your allegiance to your company and he would say how doctors would start doing things like euthanasia which you can see easily in, in uh canada mm -hmm. how they keep uh, had a slippery slope of uh them helping kill you, you know, for what it, for you know, it's supposed to be like chronic it, diseases. They got suicide pods in Europe now. Exactly. All right. And this is that's what he even says this over and over worldwide, not just US, worldwide. And then I then I find I found old articles from the 50s that this doctor that Dr. Dunnigan talked about, Dr. Richard Day, which my video, of course, Richard, my, my videos, I think one's called um Confessions of a Dick, because Richard Dick. That's the first one. The second one is um, a little more dick when I found out more information. So then I found out that this doctor that did, did this um, did this these lectures around for pediatrics in the late sixties, in the fifties took in Heim, uh, him. Is it was it Himmler? Mm -hmm. Who was who was who was no who was who was Hitler's architect? Speer Spears. All right, Albert mm -hmm. Spears. Yeah, this yeah, yeah. this doctor took in Albert Spears' daughter, oldest daughter. I don't know if he's the oldest, but his daughter, um, Hilda Spear, in the fifties, which at the same time period as as Operation Paperclip. So she came and lived right. with Dr. Day. I found the, I found this in the multiple articles. She came and lived with Dr. Day, and learned you know went to school with his daughters, and you know they said to learn the like the democratic way of life. And then I found out Dr. Guy Doshik, the admitted pedophile that was convicted, he had 49, at least 49 uh, foster children from uh, islands like Papua New Guinea and other islands. Went to jail for it, uh, admitted to 400, two to 400 kids, I think, between the ages of eight and 12, the guy that oh. made up the slow virus theory. I found out in the 40s or 50s, he brought in a little German boy, a little German boy, and had his mother adopt him. And he went on to be like this big guy, not in the Department of Defense, but something like that. It's in a video I made. Hmm. He went on to be that. And Hilda Speer, Hitler's architect's daughter, went on to be a German politician. Uh, fuck, she got married and her name changed. It's in the video I made called A Little More Dick. I know ladies would understand that, but <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's so fucked up. I don't, I don't even know, man. 
But in my opinion, they're both involved in paperclip. The pedophile that made up the slow virus theory that they claimed AIDS can cause HIV, HIV can cause age, which isn't a disease. It's a collection of diseases that they kept adding to over the years. You know, they expand it. And um, basically, if you have the actual disease and you don't test positive for a fraud test, you can actually be treated for it. <laughs> but if you test positive for a fraud test, you get chemotherapy till you die. That's how they killed Freddie Mercury and many other people. And so it's well, that's up. how they how they kill many people that they say are <laughs> going to die of cancer if they don't pump them full of chemicals. I if I had cancer, I would never do that. Uh, Fuck no, 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 uh, yeah, yeah. And that, there are cures for cancer, or and I can I can't say cures. I can I can at least say treatments for cancer that aren't toxic right. that have been suppressed. One in particular fought by the FDA. Well, no, two in particular fought by the FDA for decades and tried to shut up and try to put people out of business, arrest people. The FDA is there to block the truth. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're there. They're, they don't even do their own uh, experiments. The yeah, they're, uh, they're a lobby for uh, mainly for pharma and agra. Pharma pays point. pharmaceutical companies pay most of their, um, most of their south their money yeah well yeah and you've got you've got folks like uh dr scott gottlieb who is totally not related to sydney everyone they go don't, back and forth don't even they go, think yeah. about that they I yeah, finally they proof go of back that, and forth but doesn't mean that the, yeah they go back and forth it's a revolving door yeah pretty much yeah yeah so no matter no matter door. who's running the fda it's it's pharma's guy yeah it doesn't matter yeah, and it's back and forth. The FDA, they don't do, they don't let people know that though. They don't do any of their own experiments. You think, oh, the FDA approved? Well, they this, straight dude. up lie when and, and, when they put yeah. out the disclosure statements where they're supposed to be telling you what their conflicts of interest are, and they totally oh, don't tell you what any of their conflicts of interest are. They're like, oh no, it's good, it's fine. Don't worry about it. They, don't don't look at it. They've approved medicines that kill people mm -hmm. over scientific papers of the, of the experiments from certain certain um companies pharmaceutical companies that they just made up they didn't even do any test they just made it up and they found that out but they would still put shit out i don't remember in particular it's not viox but they they knew about the viox they get oh, the yeah. head fda guy at the time knew about viox they knew about people. viox way ahead of time oh yeah they still kept going with it it took them five years to stop mm -hmm. after they found out that it was like giving people heart attacks and that's not the only example I mean, if we want to get into it, we can probably drag out about 10 to 15 different <laughs> pharmaceuticals that follow the exact same pattern. It's that's, going that's pattern. it's going to happen with fucking Ozempic and Wagovi within the next yeah. five years. I guarantee it. Oh, yeah. Believe me, I would love to take some, if, if I could take something to fucking lose a little weight, you know, but <laughs> I know if I just stopped drinking for a while. But, yeah, times are tough. Times are tough. I mean, I'm a recovered drug addict and, you know. But well, you got to protect your sanity on. in this age somehow. Oh, man. my God. I know, man. So I know. The, the fact that you've been able to make it this far and and you're still as as charming and entertaining as you are. I try, man. But, that's a uh, testament right there as far as I'm it's, concerned. It's been rough. I'm talking about like depression, just like because it's 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 the world is a lot darker than I ever, ever would have thought like four or five years ago well they so lied naive. to us growing up man they totally yeah, fucking lied to us we were not prepared for the world that we inherited at all <sighs> and i i have no other uh assumption that i can make about it other than that was specifically by design like yeah. i don't remember it was or, or i don't know if if you were one of the kids that got tapped for whatever the program was called in your area in my area it was gifted and talented Right, where they come to you in like fifth grade and pull you away from the rest of the class and know you guys are going to do other things because you're you're special. You're better than the other kids. I think moving out of state helped me away from that, but I did make it Probably straight did, A's though. and B's. Yeah. In seventh grade, I know for instance, I went in a science thing and I uh and everybody made straight A's. And I was like it was only like twelve or fourteen of us. I was the only boy, and I was like a little shy boy with a mullet and a Metallica shirt. So I didn't even, you know, I was the only boy. I remember that, but uh, damn, a yeah, mullet and straight A's. That was baller back in the day. <laughs> well, I mean, it was easy. I mean, I, I've always been smart. I quit school with uh, technically 10th grade, kind of ninth grade, but good for you. 
Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, there was a few reasons. I was, you know, my 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 second stepfather had left my mom, and I had to help pay bills. Plus, I knew it was bullshit, and and also uh, my my English teacher was a bitch. So, yeah, there's lots of reasons. But I'm glad I did. I don't even have a GED, but I'm glad, I'm proud about that too. I actually I was able to uh, drop out both of high school and college. Yeah, yeah. Ain't nothing wrong with that. I went to college for a little bit. Not really. I dated a girl I was in college. I would go to, like sleep in her dorm room that I wasn't supposed to be at and shit. And then when I had a I friend that did that. <laughs> I wasn't supposed to be there. Like you were, you could visit, but you weren't supposed to be there. Say the night. I'd walk her to class and use her lunch tickets, like her lunch uh, card, to oh, go yeah, to this, yeah, yeah. these cafeteria with these different restaurants in it and just eat on her dime. So smoke cigarettes. Yeah, I had a friend that did that at uh, George Mason University in Northern Virginia right. back like mid two thousands. It, it was the exact same setup. He would just get her a meal <laughs> card and yeah, go chow yep, down yep. in the uh, Ours, cafeteria. This was Coastal Carolina, Coastal Carolina University, nice. right here on the outskirts of Myrtle Beach. Nice. So, well, Jamie, yep. I don't know how much time you had uh, budgeted for this appearance. We're already an hour in, so we just hit the top. I'm good, of man. I can keep going hour. for a little bit. Okay. Yeah, I can go for a little bit. Yeah, okay. like maybe another half an hour or something. No, 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 right. My kids are asleep by then. I drugged them with, uh, what's that shit called? Melatonin. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> a melatonin gun. No, Epic not my parenting kids. right there. My son, at least. My daughter, uh, she wouldn't sleep a lot. My daughter, does, does, she's eight. But she does gymnastics and stuff. Actually, that's the only time I've been able to go out of town, really, for the last couple of years. We have to go to Charleston in uh, like a week or 10 days. And uh, yeah, so, oh, I don't know what that was. We travel with her. My son's an asshole, but it's kind of, you know, it's kind of like me. So he took some melatonin and passed out. There you go. <laughs> I think he's passed out. He could be out there fucking with the dog or something. I don't know, but I think he's passed out. Well, I want to go ahead and ask you this question, because this was actually sent in by an audience member. And I think it's, it's a pretty good question. Uh, it comes from the DJ Hi Yona, so he has a, a little bit of experience in the subject matter. And the question is, what is your favorite part of playing live music for an audience? Everything past like the second or third song. <laughs> like I get, I get. So even I've been playing live music since live music since I was fourteen, and I'm forty four, so thirty years. I still to this day get nervous. I'm anxious and nervous as fuck until about three songs in and I loosen up a lot, you know, maybe now because in the, the band, like I'm in, I'm still in two active, active bands, but uh, I don't know, since like 2013, I switched from just guitar usually. Every now and then I play bass for a band, but just guitar usually to keyboard and guitar. So I'm even to this day, 10 years later, I'm not as confident on keyboard, but in my most prominent band down tribe, I mostly play keyboard because somebody's got to fucking do it. Right. I play guitar too, but mostly keyboard and I have two keyboards and, and no, I don't know any of the songs. I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. I take a notebook and I write down the song name and I write down the chords next to it, whether it's a, if it's a minor like uh, sometimes it don't matter if it's a major or minor. I'm just gonna hit like a power chord on the keyboard, right? And I can play with two hands and everything, but my right hand is—I'll uh, be on my left hand. My left hand, honestly, even if I bubble, it's usually one finger because it sounds like too much with two fingers. Sometimes it's two fingers, but I, I can bubble with two fingers in reggae. But uh, usually it's just my thumb, three fingers from my right hand. But uh, yeah, I just have the chords written down. If it's a minor, I'll write uh, M, like A minor. If it's a major, sometimes I write like a, a madge. If, if it needs to be a whole chord, sometimes mm -hmm. they don't. Sometimes I don't remember. Sometimes I don't remember. But you gotta understand, sometimes we play like three sets, which is like four hours worth of material with a couple of breaks in between. I don't know what the fuck I'm doing, but I know music. I know how to play music. So if I just have like a cheat sheet there, then I can, uh, not that I always need it, but I'll just have it there. And I'll be like, you know, it just gives me the confidence to do it a little better. But my favorite part, yeah, everything past three, like three songs, I'm, I'm chill. So, so is there know. is there a gig that stands out in your mind that was just like mind blowing? Opening for Wasp in 2010, 
Wacky, I'm out back. All right. I got us on the show somehow because I, I heard Wasp is coming through again. I get us on the show. I brought, I brought our CD up to Suck Bang Blow, which is a local bar. There was two locations at this time. I brought it to the original. Even though Wasp was playing the bigger one, the, the newer one, uh, which is now it's a Walmart, but it was Suck Bang Blow Four Corners. So I got us on the show. They called me. I got us on the show. And the day of the show, the promoter tells me, he's like, uh, the uh, support band was fired from the tour today. They were on tour with a band from Italy called Rain. I think it, I think it was R. No, I think it was R-A-I-N. It might have been R-E-I-N. I'm not sure, though. I think it was R-A-I-N. This Italian I think I might have actually heard that band. Really? All right. Yeah. So they get, I don't know why they got fired, but they got fired that day. So the promoter's like, can you be direct support for Wasp? I'm like, yes, we can. <laughs> and I was just playing guitar at this point. Yeah. So I, I was a lot more, just I've been playing guitar since 11. I was 11 years old. So I, I was a lot more confident. So uh, that show was fucking amazing. I'm out back before the show. I had anxiety. Like I always still, I still get anxiety before a show, but I was out back sitting on pallets. Like a blackie lawless comes walking by me. And I heard not like, I don't know who told me, but I heard not to make eye contact with him. So I didn't look at him or anything. I looked at him. I didn't make eye contact, though. I didn't talk to him. But Blackie Lawless is fucking like eight foot ass. It's walking by. I was like, Blackie Lawless just fucking walked by me. Because I, I love like 80s rock and 80s metal. I'm like a huge fan. I always have been. And uh, yeah, that was amazing. Opening for Wasp. There's still video out there. We're playing one of our songs. And Ed, Ed is my best friend. He's my singer of my reggae band today. He was a singer of my my you know rock eighties metal punk rock band still back then Shark Legs we were pretty big I have I was I have this tattooed on my neck we're pretty, a pretty shitty tattoo but uh, we played with a lot of eighties bands and uh, yeah so Ed this video is like a forty five second video he's pouring whiskey down my throat as I'm trying to play like this lead on, on guitar and I'm like back then the joke was my birthday every year my friends would buy me a shot of whiskey and then kick me in the nuts as I was taking the shot. And I mean, after like 10, 12 years of them doing it, I knew they were going to do it, but I still let them kick me in the nuts because, just because it was like tradition, I guess. All right. So, yeah, I couldn't drink whiskey, though. It was hard for me to drink whiskey. Meanwhile, I've had these three mini bottles, but this is peanut butter whiskey. It's a little different than straight whiskey. That's different. Yeah. It's yeah. Not real so, Ed, yeah, yeah. So, Ed pour, like, pours a shot down my throat, and I didn't know what it was. He like made me, made me drink it as I'm playing guitar. So there's video of me taking this shot that he pours down my throat, and he's like, I'm like, what the fuck was that? You can see me mouth on that. Because you can't, I don't have a microphone in my face. You just see me like, what the fuck was that? And I take a swig of beer on playing guitar one-handed or whatever. But that was opening for Wasp, and that was pretty amazing. Yeah. That is pretty awesome. Even in 2010. Even in 2010, this was they were doing the um great album too, uh, that came out either that year or the year before. It was Babylon's Burning. And that was a great song. And that was a great tour. I mean, yeah, they did a lot of old shit too, but uh it, it yeah, it was awesome. That's like one of my highlights of my life it was opening for Wasp. So we opened for well, we opened for the Bull the Bullet Boys too. And we got in a fight with them though. They, they talked shit about us while they were using our amps. And Ed wasn't gonna take it. And uh my friend Sean wasn't gonna take it, who was my other guitar player. Because he was using his fucking amp on stage, his half stack. So, because, all right, the show started late. There was four bands. The first band went on late. They were called Pyromatic. They sounded just like Poison. They went on late. And then there was a big pause between bands. And the next band played. And uh, it was already late already. And they played their set. And then it was our turn. We get on, and you know it's later than we're supposed to play, but whatever. We're just with a co-headliner, so we just play our set. And as we're on stage, we see the Bull Boys walk in. It was like twelve thirty when they walked in, so they didn't even come to the fucking show till like at least midnight. And I'm on stage, and I see Mark Torrey and the singer walk by, and whatever his band was at the time, because it was just him and some other guys. And we're like, oh fuck yeah, we're playing with the Bull Boys, you know, smooth up in you. I don't know if you remember that song or not. Oh yeah, yeah. All right, so we're playing with the Bull Boys. And uh, part of the thing with the promoter was they needed amps because they were torn without amps. So I had a half stack. My well, guitar player had a half stack. We let him use their bass amp. And the another band let him use their drums. So they're playing, and three, four songs in, I'm like, fuck yeah, I'm in the audience. I'm like, fuck yeah, you know, because I'm, I'm drunk, I'm excited. And Mark Torrey starts talking shit about us. 
and saying like, fuck that last band. They played way too long. You're not here to see them. You're here to see the Bullet Boys, right? Meanwhile, it's my town. It's our town. It's a, we live here. Right. There's a lot of people there that are friends with us, right? It's a home game. It, yeah, exactly. And like we were, you know, we got pretty big and we had a lot of friends, including the, the fucking bar owner who gave us a van later on because he felt bad. Uh, so we're like, what the fuck? So my singer, my best friend, Ed, he's like, no, fuck that shit. And my other guitar player go up to the side of the stage and they're playing a song and Mark t- in, in between, like, uh, they think he's taking a break or whatever, in between, but not in between songs, but during a song, he walks over to the side of the stage. In the video, you can see him walk over the side of the stage and then a few seconds later come back because my band was right, right there like, nah, what are you talking about? You know, you use the ramps. We, we didn't play too long. The show started. They're trying to explain it to him. Mark ends up stopping the show, calling security, trying to get us kicked out. Meanwhile, we're friends with the bar owner. We we played it with LA Guns. We played there with a bunch of other bands, sold out shows. The guy loved us. You know, the guy, Rick, the guy that owned the club at the time, was in the New York Times because he was making guitar picks and he had a bunch of Shark Lakes picks. Our, my band, our band, fucking loves us. Like, we're friends with him. So, of course, he was going to kick us out. And I was friends with the promoter. And then, and, we agreed to let him use our hands for the show. So Mark kicks, Mark tells him to kick us out. Rick, the owner of the bar, is like, I can't, I'm not gonna kick you out, but get, you know, they just want to get the show over with, whatever. We agreed to go outside. All right, at that point, so they would continue the show. Because they had it was sold out. The show was sold out, and then we didn't want to fuck our friends over, the, the bar owner and the promoter. Right. So we go outside. And Ed's like, no, fuck this. I need an apology. So Ed gets backstage, my singer, and like he's talking to him, talking to Mark Torian, and, and eventually there what I don't know where it went. There was video of a little bit of this. This is back, this is 2008. So it's like you, I mean, YouTube is around and stuff. There was video on Daily Motion, it's gone now. Of this, there is video of Mark kicking us out of the show. That's still up. It's on YouTube too, because I put it there, but it was on Daily Motion back then. Uh but this little video of Ed backstage talking to Mark is gone. And Mark agrees, like, all right, dude, you're cool, but you're a bunch of fucking assholes. So Ed's like, I got to knock him out. Because he just wanted to knock him out. Just like, cause it, it would help our us. And fuck him. So he got pulled up by security that was there. You know, because he was going to knock him out. And uh, so four people with pool sticks walk Mark Torian out to their van. Because he was afraid for safety because of us, right? And uh, th- there's art- like there's articles written about this. This is really big at the time on things like Metal Sludge, which at- back then was a forum. And uh, there's, an- there's another one. I forget what it was called, but Metal Sludge and something else. So it got us a lot of publicity. We were shark legs, one word, like a shark with legs. It got us a lot of publicity. Shark legs versus bullet boys. Uh they were apologizing the rest of the band because Mark was like a has been nobody. You know, they had the one song, uh, Smooth Up In Ya. Right. But we didn't expect any of this. He was just such a fucking asshole, and Ed didn't want us to look shitty. Now, Ed's my best friend. I'm still in a band with him today. It's reggae now, but we're old stoners, so it makes sense, you know? <laughs> but back then, it was more like Shark Legs was like rock and roll meets 80s metal meets punk rock. So we were like, we were like, the punk rock Iron Maiden. We had dueling leads here and there and shit like that. So it worked out for a lot of those bands. But I will say that that's all really that happened that night. We heard later that they were playing another show in Tennessee and Mark had lied and said that we pulled the knife on him. They never happened. We never pulled the knife on him. And then we had a uh, booking agent for a while. We were supposed to tour with Britney Fox, the 80s band. Mm-hmm. Right before the tour, the, the bass player broke his hand. They had to cancel the tour. And our promoter asked us if we still wanted to go. He had the shows booked. He had the hotel rooms. We're like, fuck it. Yeah, we'll still go. Fuck it. Might as well. But yeah, but what, like, Mark is from Naples, Florida, the singer of the Bullet Boys. And we were playing that whole Tampa Bay area. And he heard our name and he flipped out and said he wouldn't do the show or whatever. So then we got, we had to get kicked off the show. But then he quit. And then we went back on the show. So we ended up playing anyway. But um, yeah, fuck him. The coolest band ever, the Bull Boys. They were also not sorry. They, fuck them. That's Mark Torian. That's the band I was just talking about. The coolest band ever, Bang Tango. Bang Tango. We toured with. I, I, they, okay. tang- they had uh, what was their hit? The one hit they had. Uh, well, they had a few hits. If you ask me. All but... right. Their their biggest hit was someone like you. 
Yeah. So what? Yeah. All right. So um, Joe will stay the singer. Cool ass dude. I smoked so much weed with Joe. Uh, they thanked Shark Legs and one of their albums because I let I met them in Myrtle Beach at the at the warehouse that I had right, and I gave them the key, and I let them rehearse because they were on tour. And they had a couple of days off, and so they wrote a song in our warehouse. I even I had no weed, but I had a bunch of roaches. I rolled a fucking blunt of roach weed for them, for Joe Joe especially, and I left it there for him. I was like, here you go, here's a blunt, you know. And uh, my singer Ed was playing an acoustic show, and I was just going to hang out. Fucking Bang Tango shows up at the show. They hang out. I smoked weed with Joe and um, the bass player at the time, Lance. Yeah, Joe and Lance, because we were the big pot heads. Me, Joe, uh, me, Joe and Lance went on tour with them. Played a bunch of shows. This is over the course of a couple of years. Played a couple of shows with them one year, then went on tour with them the next year. Uh, they thanked Shark Legs in their album "Pistol Whipped in the Bible Belt," and uh, I even found a video later on after not talking to them of Joe Stay. And Nashville talking about bands that like bands he grew up listening to. The video's out there, and bands that he likes now. And he says the he says Muse is really good. Shark Legs. He mentions my fucking band, Shark Legs, in this fucking thing. He mentions three bands. My band's one of them. This is a singer of Bang Tango, you know, really That's cool guy. They awesome. wanted, to, yeah, he's cool. They were cool as shit, man. They're the coolest guys I ever fucking toured with, you know, played with or whatever. They came and supported my singer acoustic. He just hung out with us to just hang out and smoke weed and drink and shit. Coolest guys ever, man. Yeah. Bull boys suck. Bang Tang was awesome. I'll quote you on that. I might even put it <laughs> on a t-shirt. You never know. You, you know who else I met? I've been sevenfold. I hung out with them at a strip club, too. Oh, really? What was that like? <laughs> I was so drunk, man. This is like... Because they've I was all younger. basically been together since high school, right? Yeah. All right. This is like uh, right after that. What, what was the album? Back Country. I have a copy of it somewhere signed by them. Uh, City the, of Evil. All right. Yeah. That's the uh, album. That album. Yeah. Well, right. Fucking awesome album. I, I didn't get this one because my the, all those other ones were because of my own band. This is earlier on before that band because uh, I was still living with my mom. I won tickets on a radio, right? And then they had a thing, an extra thing. That some some ticket winners would uh, w- also win backstage at the um, VIP room at the Crazy Horse, a strip club, after the show. So somehow I got that too, right? I won tickets on the radio. Then me me and my brother did another thing where we won other tickets to bring whoever else. I was trying to bring friends, but we ended up bringing our sister. I have a, I have a younger sister. My all right. I'm a guitar player mostly, possibly bassing and keyboard. My brother, my little brother was my bass player for a decade. And at that point, my little sister, our little sister, was my keyboard player. We had a band called Down by Blood for a while. Me, my brother, and sister, and then two other brothers. So, anyway, at this point, uh, yeah, so we, we won tickets twice. And then, so we brought my sister and my brother's girlfriend. And then we also won backstage at VIP at the Crazy Horse, a strip club, after the show. So we went and hung out with Avenged Sevenfold there. I was so fucking drunk. This is back before your cell phones had cameras. Right. And as I'm walking in, I had like a, back then we would just have those those disposable cameras. And we went through WKZQ, which is a local radio station. And I asked the DJ as I'm walking in, he's like, no, you can't bring a fucking camera in a strip club. So I couldn't bring a camera. So I remember telling M Shadows, whatever his name is, and my mom thought he was hot because that, that's true. My mom did think he was hot. And this is before the drummer died of a heroin overdose, right. I think. Yeah, I don't remember, but we hung out with them in a band called Bolts and Octane, me and my brother and sister, at a strip club in like probably 2004, maybe five. Oh, that's so I- awesome. <laughs> so awesome. Because that was yeah. shit. That was. Um trying to think of the album that would have been current at that time i think it was the one right before city of evil city of evil maybe it was later out. then when did that come whenever that I was, it was right like 2007 that. i don't know it was whenever that came out because it came out it was like they played hustle blues and it was uh i feel i felt like it was earlier but you know my memory is not great i felt like it was earlier but maybe it wasn't that much earlier and they came out to Beetlejuice song. That, oh, shit, I was off 2005. So it was right before City of Beetlejuice. All right, so, all right, 2005. Yeah. yeah, all right. All right, yeah. So it was around that time. I, I know it was before. 
we started Shark Lakes in 2006 at some point. It was a band I was in before that called the Hollywood Water Rats. And the reason I know that is because Bullets and Octane, I, I remember being drunk. At this point, I still remember. I still have memory. And I'm talking, I'm talking about because they were from Hollywood, I think. And I was playing in a band on the East Coast called the Hollywood Water Rats. It was after Bound My Blood and before Shark Legs. And we were more rockabilly. We played uh, with Hank Williams III. Nice. Yeah, the Hollywood Water Rats. Yeah. Can you hear me again? Yeah, yeah, I yeah. My, my, my cord all fucked up. You got it a was short. Hank 3. I, not anymore, I hope, but it, yeah, it was all twisted up. I love Hank 3, man. That, that's some good shit. Oh, yeah. Well, it's it's nice to see him get, you know, back to more like what his grandfather was doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it putting was like, like his own spin on it, too. It, it's, well, it's definitely, it, it's it's his own music. This, this is probably 2004 I played with him. It was him. Just going under Hank three, mm-hmm. and then it was also or Hank Williams the third. Then it was also Ash Jack and another, I think another version. Of, I don't know, but they were fucking. I, I, I was I was drunk or on drugs a lot in my life. So it's hard for me to remember all the specifics, but yeah, it was really good. Like blew me away alive. I still love the song today. Crazy Country Rebel was like I love that song. Oh yeah, you know that's a great I, I love songs about drugs, being a drug addict or recovering drug addict. Well, and fortunately, there drugs. there are quite a few songs about drugs, especially yeah. in the rock and roll <laughs> genre. Yeah, it I just know. so happens. I mean, oh shit, me and my mom used to do drugs together all the time. Me and my mom were both hooked on opiates together, and first I did, first time I did cocaine with with my mom. Oh wow! So, yep. But I'll again, I'll never know what that was like. My mom was <laughs> like, you know, the uh, the the most innocent person you could possibly think of right yeah outwardly outwardly she, she had <laughs> a hell of a temper though yeah well don't we all yeah. i'm i was like uh, my mom was my best friend for many i mean i felt she just talks a lot she talks a lot i wish she would smoke weed and just chill but but she's still <laughs> one of my best friends you know like i got well here's the thing i tell my mom anything and i worry about it to this day dude that's she's awesome. only nine she's 19 years older than i am you know like you can't that's it that's you can't get that anywhere else. At yeah, least I don't yeah. think you can. One one of these days, I do want to bring her out here and do a live stream with her, just so she can uh, corroborate some of my stories because she knows all about them all. The only thing I ever felt weird about talking to my mom about was sex, but you know, I when I, I live with where she lives with us now, with me and my significant other, she helps take care of the kids for us. When you know, we should do, but as a roommate, though, it's not her house. It's uh. Let's just say you date up, you know, if you come from poor white trash and you want to uh, have some stability with kids, you knock somebody with money up is all I'm going to say. Yeah, that's not, one way. Not like, I did it. It, not like I did it on purpose, but, you know, not the, not like the rich or anything, but. So what you're saying from, is you you tripped and, and your dick just kind of. <laughs> what I'm saying is. Up easy, you know. It, I've dated people just like me and I dated people from that come up from a high cast than me and uh that's a lot easier because I'm a mess and I always have been. So So is there is there like one spot that people can go to to get access to all of your music? Like the the entire catalog? I need to make something. I, I know on you remember that site Steam It? Mm-hmm. I haven't been there. I haven't done. I haven't done anything on that in a while. I don't even know if I can sign in to it anymore. I know I made. I made something a while back with all my music, and I need. I need to do it again. But uh, at the moment, there is an old Steve article, but I don't remember when I made it. And uh, I've probably been in a couple because my, my my reggae band. I was in the band in 2013, and we were playing a lot. But I was fucking around on her. She was pregnant and stuff, and she beat my ass. She, she beat me in this other girl's ass. It's a long story, but she beat her asses after after we had my son because I was fucking around on her like an idiot. And uh, well, actually, it was after a high speed chase through Myrtle Beach, and we ended up at the uh, Myrtle Beach police station, and nobody helped us. Me and this, me and this other chick. But like I said, this led all this led to my spiritual awakening. But it was me and this other chick. I didn't know what to do, you know. And so I just fucking hit the gas and she chased us and we ended up at the police station. She brought us in. 
I said, don't hit back. We deserve this. She beat my ass and saw the girl's ass right there. Nobody came out and helped us. And I'd already been in the night jail once for uh, driving suspended. So I'm glad that I didn't have to go back to jail. But I went on the run for about a week. And then I was like, you know what? You know, I grew up without a dad. I, I don't want my son to. So I ended up going back home. And then, you know, that after a while, after facing my shadows, you know, that, that's, that's tough. Because that was a pattern I had, just fucking... Go go for a while till you're not happy. Start cheating, get caught, and run. And that, that was a pattern I was stuck in for probably a decade. And then, uh, yeah, I went back home and faced the music, and then started meditating and all that shit. Then I had spiritual awakening, and uh, I, I changed the pattern. And if I didn't, I would never have my daughter, you know. But uh, I forget what we're talking about because I'm pretty like high and drunk, so. <laughs> what, what is one place to find all of your music? But I think we already got the answer. What was I talking about that then? <laughs> Me neither. I don't know, but it's I, I love hearing things like that because it always offers insight. That was off topic. Yeah. Yeah. That you, it's can't, true, though. you can't get anywhere else. You know? Yeah. It's, that, it's, been, over, it's been over a decade. It's I always try to impress on people that even though you you can hear other people tell stories uh, about things that they've experienced in your life, it doesn't really mean as much until you actually go through that stuff yourself. Because yeah. a lot of a lot of what you're going to hear in those stories is going to be similar to what you experience, but it's not going to be exactly the same because oh, you're rough. not the same as that other person that experienced oh, no, no. that thing. That, that was me like 11, 12 years ago. My son just turned 11, you know, and like I said, I wouldn't have my my daughter. I love, oh, I mean, I love both my kids, but my daughter is amazing. I would never have her. She'll come out here and jam with me. I'll play guitar or bass and she'll play drums. You know, she's only eight years old. I think so. you put some of that stuff up on I, uh, yeah, the internet. I have put it, you? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I do. Here and there. I got a very decent drum set, so I just wish my son would jam with me, but he doesn't have any, really any, any interest. You know, he's just in the video games and guns. So I try to support him too, though. Hey, at least he's into guns. That's that should <laughs> serve him well. It's airsoft coming up. Yeah, it's airsoft right now, but you know, it's still a skill. <laughs> I told him though, I want to take him because I got a nine mil when they started like pushing the jab. I went and got a nine millimeter because I needed something. Because I was like, that, that's a line I'm not crossing. They're not going to force me to do fucking anything. And if I go out that way, I go out that way. It was worth it to me. And it still is, honestly. Yeah. I'm not getting it. I will not get it. If you come at me with it, I'm going to shoot you. <laughs> you know? So I needed that's something fair. to shoot somebody with. It's fair to me. Yeah. You come to my door and you're saying you're going to fuck mandatory. I mean, again. Me? Based on what we've seen just over the course of the last three years, if someone's trying to force that on somebody else, in my book, that's assault with a deadly weapon. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, and I live in South Carolina. Thank God it's a redneck state because yeah. you're not coming to my house doing that shit. But I was afraid they might. So I went and bought a gun. So how the, hell, them, how the hell do they keep getting Lindsey Graham elected? Well, I, I, I think because they, they need... I don't know. Like, don't I don't know anybody in South Carolina that fucking wants anything to do with them, right? You know what I mean. So I, I don't know how they're getting elected, but yeah, I don't know. I think he's just serious. Like he put, I don't know. To as I don't know what the word is, but he he's there to the cause. He's there to cause some fucking ruckus. That's all I'll say. Oh yeah. Well, he's he's there to cause ruckus, and then he's also there to be the power bottom. Uh, when the situation calls for it, I would assume I would not assume he's the top. I would assume no. that when Bill Gates and him fuck that he's on the bottom. Yeah. yeah, he must he must push back pretty good. I think he enjoys it actually. Well, obviously, yeah. obviously he looks. You know, I never ate. I never went to a pig picking before I moved here, and he looks like he looks like he reminds me of the pig that would be on the grill that you just fucking like pick the barbecue off of. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have see no that. clue, man. I have no fucking clue. Especially now that he's gotten older and he's like really bloated. Yeah. Yeah. Little murder I said, goblin. I, I thought you said I, I had two uh, monitors here. So one's blocked. I thought you said erection, not election. <laughs> <laughs> not I may, me, I may I have. Did. Who knows? <laughs> 
It's hard to tell at this hour of the It's evening. not an erection. It's an election. <laughs> well, Jamie, uh, you have been incredibly generous <laughs> have uh, <I>? with <laughs> your time this evening. I don't uh, know what I did. I even know what I said, so don't hold it against me. No, we appreciate you coming and, and hanging out with us tonight. I'm, I'm pretty honest and open no matter what. I mean, I've made lots of mistakes in my life, but I wouldn't be who I am if I didn't. So uh, That's true. All of that is true. And yep, I don't yep. think you would be half as entertaining if uh, if you weren't the person I hope that I was. you are. I don't, oh, like yeah. I said, I'm pretty high in drugs. So. Dude, the the chat has been going wild all night. I'm not, I mean, I say drunk. I'm not really drunk. I have a little buzz. You know, but that's enough for me to open up. So there you go. All right. So I'm I've pretty got, slutty uh, as it is. So. In the show <laughs> description, I've got your Twitter account, your three YouTube accounts, your Facebook, your Instagram, BitChute, Rumble, and even your uh, your Teespring uh, website all in there. Is there anything <laughs> that I missed? I think uh, three YouTube is a little excessive. I don't even know. <laughs> I don't even know. I had to. No, I know. I have lots of them. So. As long as the main one's there, it's cool. No, I mean, there's other shit, but it doesn't matter. I'm on Rumble, Rockfin, Odyssey also. I'm on Band Video, which I don't know what's going to happen with that if they sell it next month. Mm. But uh, honestly, though, uh, when I first came in the chat or I first came live, somebody said something. They compared my videos to Greg Reese, which I appreciate mm. because I am on Band Video, which is Infowars, and that's after my channel first got deleted, and Greg is the one that got me on man video so yeah i have uh i have respect for greg he helped me out he used my videos a lot he, like at the point he was putting out information i found and after like three or four videos he's like do you just want a channel and i was like I, yeah sure why not so yeah i uh, have a lot of respect for greg he helped me out that's awesome but yeah yeah i mean whatever that's fine uh deluxe nation.com i since i i did get kicked off of linktree which I weirdly enough, a couple weeks ago, I got my link tree back. I don't know if I have it back, but they uh, they stopped banning me, I guess, or whatever. So I don't know why, but uh, hmm. yeah, I started my own um, website just to have it, just to put links on to all my other shit. So it's deluxenation.com. All right, I'll make sure to uh, get that in the updated notes when uh, when we get the replays published in the morning as well. That's awesome. the only thing I missed. Because I went awesome looking game. for, like, I was looking for, like, jamiedeluxe.com or jamiedeluxe.net. Didn't see any just, of those. But, yeah, so Deluxe kind of Nation. Stuck there. Yeah. yeah. I'll send it to you. And I appreciate yeah. you having me on. I'm sorry it took too long. If you ever want me on again, I'll come on again. Just bug me. You got to no, bug me. This was, this was, I think this was <laughs> the perfect time. This was awesome. when it was supposed to happen. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks for having me, man. Good to meet you, too. Absolutely. Good to meet you as well, man. Take care. Enjoy the rest of your evening. If you want to uh, hang out on the broadcast, we'll be doing some Bill Cooper in the fourth hour tonight. All right. I might hop back in the chat in a little bit. Yeah. Give me a few minutes. I might come back. Awesome. All right, man. Thanks for having me. Thank you, everybody. I love you guys. All right. Take care, man. You too. Jamie Deluxe, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Let me see. Let me get my audio readjusted here. Hopefully one day Streamlabs will actually get all of this fixed so I don't have to press so many buttons during each and every broadcast. That would be nice. All right, that's the sound that I like hearing. I think this might be the sound that you guys like hearing. Bill Cooper at the top of the hour, ladies and gentlemen. Don't touch that knob. But I mean business. This, this is Liberty Radio. Radio.